Hey guys, in this video, we are talking about why aggregate demand is downward sloping. Now guys, we gotta do a little groundwork before we get to the heart of the matter of this video. First thing is, what is aggregate demand? It's so important students know it is total spending. That's right, total spending on domestically produced goods and services. And we have four types of spending. What are those types of spending? Consumption, investment, government purchases, and exports. Now, when we do aggregate demand, total demand for domestically produced goods and services, we are also gonna have to subtract out any spending on imports, because that stuff was produced abroad. So we got to subtract out any spending on imports. So what we're going to be end, what we're going to end up with when we talk about aggregate demand is consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus exports minus imports. And that plus exports minus imports, we're just going to say that's net exports. Just one more thing on this point about aggregate demand is basically total spending and it has four components of spending. Remember, there are four demanders in our macro economy of final goods and services. Who are those four demanders of goods and services? Again, households, businesses, government, and the rest of the world. And again, households spend money, there's your consumption. Businesses spend money, investment, government spend money, that's government purchases. Rest of the world spends money, that is export. So that's just a way to just keep that all together. Okay, aggregate demand, there's four demanders of goods and services in the macro economy. So I guess there's four types of spending. And oh yeah, I've got to subtract out my spending on imports because aggregate demand is actually the total demand for domestically produced goods and services. So I know that was a mouthful, but we need to understand that, okay? Now, here's my graph. And one thing I want students to know right off the bat with this graph is my orientation towards this graph is horizontal. A lot of times in a math class, our orientation to the graph is vertical. Why is that in a math class? Because in the vertical axis or on the vertical axis, we generally put the dependent variable in a math class. So our orientation is vertical. That's not what's going on here. The price level is the independent variable. The dependent variable is over here. And the dependent variable determines our orientation towards the graph. So again, my orientation to this graph is horizontal, okay? Which is gonna help us understand this graph. Now, here we go, let's take a look at just one point on the graph right here, okay? It's kind of all smudged up so we get that point looking a little bit nicer there. All right, right there. So just wanted to clean it up a bit, right? So that point right there, let's just understand it. Okay, so at this price level, sure, that is our total you know, aggregate demand, right? Total spending on goods and services. But again, that's made up of four components. So what we're gonna say is, hey, some amount of that is consumption, household spending. Some amount is investment, business spending. Some of that is government purchases, government spending on goods and services. And some of that is net exports, okay? So there we go, four components, right? And you can see my horizontal orientation to the graph. Oh, one little side note here, guys. Some of y'all might look here and see the quantity of AD and you might be thinking, isn't that supposed to be real GDP? Not really, not yet at least, okay? Sure, when I get my SRAS and my LR, my short run aggregate supply and my long run aggregate supply curve, LRAS curve, I'm gonna change this to real GDP. But when I just have the air demand curve, it's actually better to think of what I'm measuring horizontally, horizontally is the quantity of aggregate demand, the quantity of uh, domestically produced goods and services demanded in our economy. So I just wanted to get that out there real quick in case people were wondering why the heck that is there. Again, that will disappear, generally speaking, we put the SRAS and the LRAS, but just so you know, that quantity of AD really doesn't need to disappear. Sometimes when I put all those curves on this graph, I still put real GDP, but then underneath it, I also put quantity of AD, quantity of AS to remind students, hey, we are measuring the quantity of AD when we think of this particular curve right there. Okay, I know, we gotta get to it, right? Why is this thing downward sloping? I got one more thing I've gotta cover, guys, before I get into it. It is not downward sloping. The aggregate demand curve is not downward sloping for the same reason the demand for a single good is downward sloping. You see, the demand for a single good is downward sloping mainly because of this effect called the substitution effect, which goes like this, guys. When the price of a good goes up, okay, Ceteris Pravis, everything else held constant, we are going to substitute away to substitute goods, okay? We're gonna head over and buy substitute goods, so the quantity of that or demanded of that good is going to go down. But remember, what were we doing when we talk about the demand for a single good, we have a price increase. We assume all the prices of all the other goods have remained constant, so they're becoming relatively cheaper. So we will substitute away to those relatively cheaper goods. That's not what's going on because again, 
air demand, we've got the price level here, okay? That's what's happening to prices generally in the economy, right? That's the level of prices in the economy. So it's not like we just have the price of a good changing. We have the prices of almost all the goods changing, okay? It is an average, so it doesn't mean the price of every good is like going up or down, but it is the general level, the average level of price is, is changing. So it is not the same thing as why a demand curve for a single good is downward sloping. And that's what PhD economists that are basically telling us what we need to cover when we cover air demand is why it is downward sloping. Because again, it's different than why the demand curve for a single product is downward sloping. All right, here we go. Let's get to the reasons, okay? If you look closely, you'll see that when my price level goes up, consumption, household spending is going to decrease. Again, it's not because we're substituting away to cheaper product. That's not what's happening because it's the price level that's going up, the level of prices, generally speaking. So what is happening? Well, it is this real wealth effect, which is really a truncated term for the full name of this term is the real wealth effect of a change in the price level. In other words, what this effect is all about is how a change in the price level, start with a change in the price level, how a change in the price level has an effect on, guess what, real wealth, right? What is the effect on real wealth of a change in the price level? So you're starting with a change in the price level, which is a change in the independent variable, which makes sense because we're doing why is something downward sloping, which is basically saying why when the independent variable goes up, does the dependent variable go down, right? That's the concept of a slope. So we're starting with that independent variable, price level goes up, and here's the thing, guys. When that happens, the value of your wealth, the real value, how much, how many goods and services your wealth can buy goes down. So the real value of your wealth, okay? So real value of your wealth goes down. Why is that? Well, just, a, just about a few, just or a couple wealth assets. One is currency. Well, when the price level goes up, definitely the real value of currency, which is if you hold some currency, which most of us do, which is part of your wealth, it goes down. Also, the money in your checking account. Usually it doesn't get paid interest or it's a very, very low rate of interest. So when that price level goes up, the real value, how many goods and services uh, that money in your checking account can buy goes down. And some of your other assets probably are gonna go down also in real terms. And what we mean by that, again, is when that price level, price of goods and services go up, the amount of goods and services they can buy goes down. That's the real value of that wealth. So the real value of your wealth goes down. And so if the real value of your wealth goes down, sorry, everything's getting smudged on my board, right? If the real value of your wealth goes down, guess what? You're gonna reduce your consumption. So the real wealth effect is focused on consumption, one of those components of AD. And that is gonna cause a decrease in the quantity of AD. And we can see that graphically, see that consumption decreasing, okay? The amount of consumption you can see is decreasing when that price level goes up. Now, investment also goes down, okay? When that price level goes up. So let's get to that. The interest rate effect, that's my bell right there. It'll stop shortly. So the interest rate effect. So again, this is the interest rate effect of a change in the price level. We want to start with a change in the price level. So the price level goes up. And when that happens, guys, that is the prices of the goods and services I'm buying going up. My utility bills going up, okay? My rent might be going up. My grocery bills going up, okay? Insurance bills I have are going up. The prices of the goods and services I'm buying are going up, okay? When that happens, I'm gonna actually need more money, right? And so I'm gonna do one of two things. I'm gonna borrow, which would put upper pressure on the interest rate, which we're trying to get to, or I might move my wealth from some assets like certificates of deposits or bonds over to money. So I'm going to make to you know cash basically. So I'm going to make less money available for others, okay? So what we say is when I'm moving it into what is called my M1 assets, okay, which is just basically my money assets like currency or my checking account, also my savings account, but I'm gonna mainly focus on currency and checking account. As I move over more um, of my wealth to my M1 assets, okay, my money assets, I'm 
demanding more money, making less money available for lending and for uh, others, okay? So this is an increase in money demand. And when you get an increase in money demand, making less money available for others, okay, you will get an increase in the price of money, which is the interest rate. And when that interest rate goes up, the number one thing it's going to affect is investment. Investment is the most sensitive type of spending to the interest rate. So investment's going to go down, which gives us a decrease in the quantity of a D. So again, investment spending goes down, price level goes up. Hey, we need more money. We're going to demand more money. The price of money is going to go up when you demand more money. What is the price of money? The interest rate. When the interest rate goes up, investment goes down, quantity of AD goes down. Finally, price level goes up. Well, let's go make sure we got this covered, right? Price level goes up, government purchases doesn't change because it's not sensitive to the price level. That's right. Government purchases determined by legislation, not sensitive to the price level. So let's jump over to that one to net exports. It's gonna decrease. And this one's very straightforward. As long as you remember, we've got the domestic price level going up, Ceteris Pravis, everything else held constant, meaning exchange rates held constant, and the price level of other countries held constant. So our price level goes up, the exchange rate doesn't change, price level of other countries doesn't change, What's going to happen? Again, very straightforward. Our prices are going up, theirs aren't, and the exchange rate's not changing. People are going to buy less of our stuff, exports are going to go down, and we're going to buy more of other people's stuff, so imports are going to go up, which means net exports is going to go down. I put XN, some people put NX, okay, both ways, net exports. We're going to get a decrease in the quantity of AD. So, one more time, just to make sure we've got it. We've got three reasons why AD is downward sloping. Each one of these reasons targets a different component of AD. There's actually four components. One of those components, GP, is not sensitive to change in the price level, but the other three are sensitive. Consumption, investment, and net exports, they all shrink. There's consumption shrinking, there's investment shrinking, there's net export shrinking. They all shrink when the price level goes up. And these are the reasons why. And remember, these names are a little funky for some students because you don't change you don't start with a change in real wealth. You start with a change in the price level and you're trying to figure out the effect on real wealth of a change in the price level. You don't start with the interest rate, you're trying to start with the price level and see how that price level has an effect on or what is the effect on the interest rate, right? And again, start with the price level changing because that's what we're doing here. It's why it's downward sloping. And what what is the effect that has on foreign purchases, okay? Them purchasing our stuff, us purchasing them their stuff. Anyhow, that is why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping. Those three effects. Why, when the price level goes up, does the quantity of aggregate demand go down? That's how you get to it. Hope it made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.